So I found out a little known fact, uh, I guess it's well known here, but uh, Dr. McDowell's a Steelers fan, and uh, I'm a Steelers fan, and I was uh, pained to find out that we lost you know, to the Ravens the first season, uh, first uh, game of the season, but then they played the Tennessee Titans the next week, and I was, you beat them, and I thought to myself, if I came here, I would just say personally, thank you, on behalf of Pittsburgh. Well done. So uh, we need each other. That's all I can say. We need each other. And uh, so that's wonderful. Listen, I want to talk with you a little bit about, um, I understand your theme uh, is the kingdom identity, fostering a kingdom identity. And I want to talk about what that means uh, to foster a kingdom identity. with our sexuality. So this is um, kind of an interesting idea. Um, it usually brings people to a session, although I think this is required, so, well, there you go. But, uh, but I'll be talking about it more tonight, the idea of what it means to uh, steward your sexuality, particularly in the area of um, homosexuality. But I want to talk a little bit about a broader understanding just this morning about um, this whole idea that, 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 that the kingdom of God is, is now and not yet. That we're inaugurated, it was inaugurated in Christ, but it's going to be consummated in his return. Um, so what is this kingdom identity? In, our, in my community, we've been studying this through Psalm 103, 1 through 5, just as an example, which is even in the Old Testament. The idea that when Christ comes, things are going to be a certain way. And when we're doing the things that Christ does, we're fostering that kingdom identity. So in that passage, every time you extend forgiveness, you foster a kingdom identity. Every time you are a part of a healing and reconciliation in relationship, you're fostering a kingdom identity. Every time you extend love and compassion to another, when you satisfy your desires with good things, you extend and foster a kingdom identity. It draws attention to the kingdom. It's like you're wearing a billboard that says, this is what I'm about. This is the brand. This is the identity that I'm about. You demonstrate the nature of the kingdom. Now, I lived in Chicago when billboards were um, kind of um, an interesting topic of discussion. This was back when Dennis Rodman played for the Pistons, and he had a billboard at one point on one of the major thoroughfares, and it was when his hair was green, and... I swear to you, it clogged up traffic because the big issue with traffic is not the number of cars. It's usually the number of people who stop to look at things on the road. And this billboard was huge, and Dennis Rodman was picturesque in uh, some of the most challenging ways possible for drivers. And traffic would be snarled for miles because of this billboard. So I'm not quite talking about that. I'm just talking about the idea that when you live out a kingdom identity, you are essentially this kind of billboard that points to this reality. Um, and I would say, if you were to take one area of your life and say, I'm going to live for Christ in this area and have it be truly countercultural, the, the one area that would truly make a difference in terms of a witness is your sexuality. It's the one area. I mean, you can do wonderful things cross-culturally, missions, and people will say, that is a wonderful way of self-sacrifice, and we should do that as Christians, absolutely. But I can tell you this, when you live for Christ in your sexuality, people don't exactly respond the same way. They don't say, well, what a wonderful sacrifice you're making for, for the world. They say, what in the world does this person believe that they would say no to one thing to say yes to something else in their sexuality? So the passages that I wanted to look at were from Matthew 5, 48. What I'm saying to you is you are kingdom subjects. Now live out your God-created identity. And Luke 6, 35, live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us. So this God-created identity is what I'm calling a kingdom identity. 
this God-created identity. And I want to talk about a couple of obstacles that make this difficult for us. What makes it difficult for us to live this out in our sexuality? So first of all, I think guilt and shame are a part of that. They're two different things. Guilt is things that we feel we've done that we regret. And shame is feeling like we're somehow fundamentally broken in our sexuality. We feel flawed or unworthy. And I think both of those things can make an obstacle to living out a kingdom identity on our sexuality. We feel like God couldn't use us or God couldn't work with us or this part of our life um, is unredeemable. And yet we know as believers, at least in our minds, that there's nothing we could do in these areas to warrant God's love and grace. So I want to ask you to do a practical prayer where you say, help me, God, to see myself the way you see me, even in this area, particularly if I've done things in the past that I regret, or for some reason I feel flawed, or I feel unworthy in my sexuality because of things that I've done or things that have happened to me. So a practical prayer is, Lord, help me to see myself the way that you see me in all areas of my life, including my sexuality. Another obstacle would be kind of worldview obstacles. One is naturalism. And that's the idea that all of what exists is the, are the things that we can see and measure. Those are the things that we know are true. And so it divorces all of our experience from transcendent reality. So the field I'm in, I'm a psychologist, is steeped in naturalism. And it just reflects the broader cultural assumption that you grow up in. That what we see and taste and touch and smell is all that there really is. If we can measure it, then we know that it's real and that it's out there. So most of us have a difficult time when we're steeped in that to think of our sexuality as tied to transcendent purposes, purposes that transcend what we can see and measure. The other thing I would call sexualization, and this is a culture that, vow, that says your value comes from your sexual appeal. And again, we're steeped in this. Every time I teach human sexuality class in my program and other schools, I have international students who say, I just don't understand the focus within your culture on sexuality. They'll say, in my culture, we're trying to have clean water. We're trying to put food on the table. We're trying to care for our people. But here, you can talk about you know, actualizing your sexuality or self-actualization of your sexual potential. We're so steeped in it, so saturated in it, that to even talk about saying no to something, to say yes to something in God's kingdom seems like, um, almost like you're, you're being abusive to yourself by saying no to something you want in your impulses. So those are things that I think only a Christian identity can really help combat both naturalism and sexualization of our culture. A third obstacle has to do with substituting one identity for a kingdom identity. We take another identity and we, we, uh, we have that define us rather than our kingdom identity. And there's many ways that all of us could potentially do that, but the one that I'm going to talk about later tonight at the Unveiled series is this idea of, of a gay identity. And I want to be really respectful of the discussions that need to take place within our culture around this and respectful of people who are sorting this out in their lives. But one of the things that we've seen in the research we've done over the last 14 years in, um, in my work in, my, in the institute that I direct is that there are pathways people take in terms of their identity when they deal with same-sex attractions. And for some, they integrate that into a gay identity, and that's what I'm talking about, just one example where it substitutes one identity over another identity. But for other people, I've seen them say no to that and form their identity around other parts of who they are as a person. Most commonly in my research has been forming their identity in Christ and having that really function as Trump in their life. So I'm going to unpack that more tonight, but that's an interesting area of research among Christians, all of whom have been dealing with this issue and talked to us about the challenges that they face. And then part of what I want to talk about tonight is how we can support the people who are part of our own communities who are dealing with this issue. How can we be faithful to them and encourage them 
as they walk out this kingdom identity. And then another obstacle, this will be the last one I want to cover here, is just has to do with the brand of being an evangelical or being a Christian. I see this on Facebook a lot with my friends and with my students, not necessarily identifying themselves as a Christian uh, or worse, an evangelical. They're more comfortable saying, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a friend of Jesus, I'm a Jesus follower. Used to be Jesus freak. I don't know if that still is on people's Facebook, but God bless you if it is. Um, But anyway, it's more, what they're trying to say is it's more relational and more personal, this thing I have with Christ. But they're uncomfortable with the brand Christianity or evangelical. And I can sympathize with that. We have some interesting people uh, who um, have that as their brand as well and are part of the Christian community. And it can be challenging. But there is a threat to a kingdom identity which is feeling like we're threatened when other people don't like the thing we stand for. And this is a day and age when we need more followers of Christ, more Christians, more evangelicals to be willing to not always be liked for some of the things that they believe in. And that's going to be difficult because I like to be liked, you like to be liked, it's a difficult thing. So what I try to do is make sure that if I'm not liked, it's for the right reasons, in a sense. I mean, Christ said that there will be people who would not like us, and that's okay if it's for those reasons. But if it's for other reasons, then I think that's where we do want to be challenged by the Holy Spirit to live faithfully before God and honor Him in our relationships. So let's talk then about what it means to foster a kingdom identity, and in particular in our sexuality. And I just first want to say, the first thing to do, I think, to begin with is just to enjoy the privilege of even having a kingdom identity. Enjoy that privilege. I don't know how often you travel, but I travel a fair amount. Not quite enough to get all the perks of frequent flyer and oodles of those miles, but enough to see the pot of the gold at the end of that rainbow. Okay, I know what I'm missing out on. So... um, This all began, I don't know if you knew, this is for free here, but this began in 1979 with the first sort of frequent flyer program. And then uh, we had AA Advantage, One Pass, Mileage Plus, Sky Miles, Executive Club, but now you can be a Gold Class member, Priority member, Silver, Platinum, Lifetime, Star Alliance, Magic Level, that's what I would like to go for, and Medallion Level. I mean, you can have all these different levels, right? And when you have those levels, it would sort of seem silly to not be enjoying the privileges that come with that identity. And I didn't even realize what these privileges were. Can I just wet your taste buds here? All right, so we know it's access to first-class lounges. We've all seen those. We've all peeked in and said, how about a little something for me, okay? But uh, it's, you know, obviously doubling, tripling mileage. You can reserve specific seats. You can get free upgrades, obviously, you can, but you can get priority on your wait list. You can not get bumped if other people are getting bumped left and right. You can waive your baggage fees, which is a huge issue today. You could, now tell me you don't want this. You could have your luggage be the first luggage to come off the conveyor belt. I mean, how many people have ever wanted that to happen? I'm, I'm with you, right here. I've been wanting that to be the first one off, and I don't have the perks to make that happen. So, um, anyway... Those are some of the privileges, and I want you to point out that in a kingdom identity, we have certain privileges and advantages to just having a God-centered identity that we stand in. And this goes back to the issue of guilt and shame that we sometimes feel in our sexuality, is that we feel like God can't use us, or there's no privileges for us, because if he knew what we really dealt with, what we really have done in the past, he wouldn't love us the way he does. And the reality is he knows those things. There's nothing hidden. And he says, there's nothing you could do to warrant the salvation I give you anyway, even in your sexuality. So it is your heritage. It's not based on your feelings. It's not based on what you've done or failed to do. It's not a magic formula. It's not an algorithm for doing it. It's not based on promises that you make to do better next time. It's a standing that you already have if you follow Christ. It's a kingdom identity with access to God, and it's a standing you have. But I think the main way that you help foster a God-centered identity is in the area of stewardship. 
So stewardship just refers to this idea of managing something, being a careful and responsible manager of something that you don't own but's been entrusted to your care. And so something that you might take home with you today is this idea that we steward our sexuality, that our sexuality is not ours. It's something that God created for us and he gives it to us to be good stewards of. Now, we sometimes think about that. We want to steward the earth and be good and responsible stewards of God's creation. We often hear people be stewards of their finances. You've maybe even thought about your education. I want to be a good steward of my time at Lipscomb. I want to be a good steward of the career God calls me to so that it's vocation for me. So I'm serving God in what he calls me to do. But I think a more difficult area has to do with stewarding our sexuality. I don't think we think about something like that. I think that's where a line gets drawn and we think of it, that's ours. God can have all those other things, but this is something that's ours, and our culture teaches us that. Now, this is difficult for us. I was reading a book recently called Traffic, and it has to do with um, just research on why traffic is as challenging as it is. If you're ever interested, it's a great beach read. Actually, it's not really a great beach read, but it's it's an interesting book. I thought it was an interesting book. It's all on cognitive science about traffic. Anyway, <laughs> this is what psychologists read when they're off duty. But, but one of the things that he said is that we have a tendency to think of our car as us. We project ourselves into our car as though the car was us. And we project ourselves through our windshield into our lane. And we treat the lane as ours. Have you ever had this? Somebody pulls in front of you in your lane, maybe 20 yards ahead of you, and you think to yourself, that's my lane. They just pulled in front of my lane. This is a cognitive thing that people do when they drive. We project ourselves. So our culture doesn't lend itself to thinking of things as not ours. I mean, if you think of your car as you, your lane as you, and you project yourself out into a highway and say, this is mine, don't be in my lane, it's going to be pretty hard for us as a people to say, in my sexuality, I will steward that because it's not mine, okay? So that's a, it's going to be a challenge for us. But just like you do with your career, just like you do with your family, just like you do with these other parts of who you are, the climate, the environment, I want to challenge you to think about stewarding your sexuality in much the same way. I like C.S. Lewis here on this. He actually talks about contrasting in the abolition of man, how we tend to look at our impulses as though they were a reliable moral guide. See, we don't steward our sexuality because we think our bodies tell us what we need, and we just do that. And that really is what our culture teaches us. And he writes, he writes this, but why ought we to obey instincts? From the psychological fact, I have an impulse to do so and so, we cannot by any ingenuity derive the practical principle I ought to obey this impulse. Telling us to obey instincts is like telling us to obey people. People say different things, and so do instincts. Our instincts are at war. You see, for Lewis, you have to stand outside of your own impulses, your own desires, to determine what you ought to do and how you ought to live. And in a sense, that's stewardship, looking for a faithful guide to instruct us on how we should live, to honor God. And then the last point I want to make about stewardship is just the idea of cultivating a God-created identity through perseverance in it, through staying the course. And so many, there may be people in this room right now who are sort of discouraged by this. Maybe you've been trying to honor God in this area of your life. You've been trying to live faithfully before God. Maybe you've had setbacks like most of us, but you feel like, can I continue with this? Particularly if you feel like you've done things that you regret. And I think that's important that we persevere as a community in these areas. Perseverance makes it easier over time. I actually um, got a letter from a family member a few years ago when I was going through a difficult time, and it dealt with this issue of perseverance. So if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to read a section of this for our purposes, having to deal with persevering when you're struggling in an area. And I want to apply this to sexuality. What does it mean to test our faith through trials or troubles? Thinking about this in your sexuality. 
because they cause us to question God's promises. They undermine our confident assurance that those things that we've not yet seen are going to happen. We've not yet seen them, and this thing that we're going through is happening to me, and I wonder if, it, if I'll ever see the things God has promised me. Yet it's at this point that endurance, that endurance comes into the picture. If we no longer have confident assurance about things we cannot see, and if we're haunted by doubt or weary in it, in the anguish that the things that we cannot see, they begin to become unreal to us. Is endurance the thing that continues on no matter what, even in the face of seemingly unending despair? Is it, in a sense, a willfully blind obedience to God, just a determination to go on, almost like Jacob wrestling with God and refusing to let go until God blessed him. It is somewhat difficult to reconcile that with James's admonition to consider these trials joy, not because of the trial, but because of the opportunity to endure, which is not an end of itself, but it's an opportunity that results in real character. And in this area, sexual character, the Christian who's ready for anything, all of this would seem to imply that a Christian whose faith is never tested would not be much of a Christian at all. In other words, God builds into our lives, into the Christian life, methodologies or aspects of character development which would not be possible outside of a fallen world. So here we have to face situations where there's a genuine opportunity to fail, to throw in the towel, so that there's also a genuinely opportunity to press on. And in pressing on, in stewarding our sexuality, we gain a victory, even a small victory of faith. And in doing that, we develop our own Christian history, our personal Christian memory that's an integral part of what it means to live faithfully before God in this area. Now, if we make mistakes, God is gracious and merciful to us, so I just want to encourage you as we close this time together to think about what it would mean to steward your sexuality, whether you're single, when you get married, whether you deal with same-sex attraction, attraction to the opposite sex. We all have a calling here to steward the impulses that we do feel, to be good and responsible stewards of our sexuality. So I'm going to continue this discussion and unpack it and apply it specifically to one of the most controversial areas of our culture today. And I'll be doing that later tonight at the unveiling, unveiled event. So um, let me just close this time with prayer and then we'll continue with our program. Just a blessing for you. I bless you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I bless you today with God's great grace. God's unmerited favor is on your life. His mercy is on you on your ministry and service, your work and your studies. May God meet all of your needs by his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I bless you with sound sleep where you have had strife and unforgiveness or misunderstanding, guilt or shame. Today you are blessed with a peace that passes all understanding. I bless you with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. The Bible says you were blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field. You were blessed coming in and you are blessed going out. Go in peace. God bless you today. Amen.